Ladies and gentlemen, the program is about to begin. Please welcome Kelly Jackson to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Arcadian Court in downtown Toronto, welcome to the Empire Club of Canada. For those of you just joining us through our webcast or our podcast, welcome to the meeting. Today we present National Chief Perry Bellegarde, Assembly of First Nations. For 115 years, the Empire Club has provided a forum for speakers to engage and debate, advancing the dialogue on issues of importance to Canada. While our name harkens back to an older time, and toasting the Queen may seem old-fashioned, we are, surprisingly to some, a forward-looking organization, committed to celebrating multiple histories and stories, engaging in challenging discussions and advancing the relationships critical to Canada's evolution. Reconciliation is about establishing and maintaining a mutually respectful relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in this country. A few years ago, we hosted a conversation about reconciliation on Bay Street, identifying opportunities for the corporate sector in responding to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action. Today, our speaker's topic is broader. From education to economic development to environmental protections and creating a just, diverse, and safe society, there is no shortage of shared areas of interest between Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous Canadians. Yet when it comes to shared experiences and quality of life, the gap is significant. When thinking about reconciliation, a key question is, how do we move forward together to recognize and address the inequality that exists and the numerous misconceptions that many still have? Through the Closing the Gap platform, Chief Bellegarde and the Assembly of First Nations have kept this question front and center on the national political scene. He has been relentless in his focus on achieving real, measurable progress across the priorities that matter most to First Nations peoples. And under his leadership, the Assembly's agenda has directly influenced the federal government's planning and priorities. According to Chief Bellegarde, the inequality gap is holding us all back from building healthy and thriving First Nations mm -hmm. and a stronger Canada. That in itself is a powerful statement on what he will be speaking about today, mm -hmm. why First Nations priorities need to be Canadian priorities. Perry Bellegarde, was re-elected National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations in 2018. Originally from Little Black Bear First Nation in Treaty 4, he has held a number of leadership roles at all levels of First Nations governance, including Chief of the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations and Saskatchewan Regional Chief for the Assembly of First Nations. Chief Bellegarde is a strong advocate for the implementation of Aboriginal and Treaty rights, presenting at the national and international levels, including at the United Nations. He has been awarded, and it's a long list, so I chose a few, the Confederation Medal, the Saskatchewan Medal, the Queen's Jubilee Medal on two separate occasions. And this year, the province of Saskatchewan recognized Chief Bellegarde with the Saskatchewan Order of Merit. 
He has spent the past 30 years putting into practice his strong beliefs on the laws and traditions instilled in him by the many chiefs and elders he has known over the years. Please join me in welcoming National Chief Perry Belgard to the podium. Thank you so much. For that. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Kelly. Mr. Mr. Papikskoy ne heo na psisi ne naskomon. Ken naskom tino al kaki ano temtek no ako maganak. Ogi mao pisi o wasa sega seo. Kuske teo maskuses o skunagan utsinia. And uh, just to my relatives and friends here, I said I speak a little bit in Cree. I'm just gonna say a little bit in Cree. Ne naskomon. I'm happy to be here. I acknowledge you all as friends and relatives. I said one of my spirit names, King Thunderbird Child, is who I am. And I also said where I'm from. And I pointed with my lips. <laughs> Little Black Bear First Nation, Treaty 4 Territory. So as well to acknowledge and, and thank Kelly for that introduction and as well as Jennifer for the acknowledgement of the land and territory here. Thank you for that. And we always say to all the members of the Empire Club, to all the dignitaries and friends and relatives in attendance, I say a big thank you for being here. And to everyone, I always say I shake hands with each and every one of you in a respectful and humble way. A big sincere thanks for coming here today. And again, to those of you that I have not met, I've already introduced myself in my language. I've done the formal way of introducing myself in Cree. And I am the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. And the AFN, it is the national organization in Canada representing First Nations. And there are upwards of 60 distinct First Nations peoples in Canada. And here I'm referring to the original First Nations of the lands. Not the reserves or the bands of Indians, but I'm speaking of the Cree people, the Anishinaabek people, the Dene people, the Haida people, the Mi'kmaq people, the Mohawk peoples, the Coast Salish people, the Halkamilan people, 60 plus different nations. And our people live in towns and cities and on more than 600 reserves spread out across the country. And I break it down quickly for some of you. There's 203 in British Columbia, there's 47 in Alberta, 74 in Saskatchewan, 66 in Manitoba, 134 in Ontario, 47 in La Belle Province de Quebec, 13 in Nova Scotia, 15 in uh, New Brunswick, two in PEI, two in Newfoundland, 14 in the Yukon, 28 in the Northwest Territories. I know the numbers because I need 60% of those chiefs to vote for me <laughs> as national chief. And so I'm elected by those chiefs from across our territories in what we now call Canada. And those chiefs are in turn elected by all their citizens and all their First Nations, on the reserve and off the reserve. So they represent all their people. And so I want to talk to you today about the relationship between First Nations peoples in Canada. What's it based on for our people? How are we doing? And what should we, wor we be working on together? And reconciliation is a big part of that picture. And it must be based on finally changing the fundamentals of how our people live in Canada and how Canada engages with us. You will see we've made progress, but there's much more work to do. And so some of the things I say today may challenge your assumptions about First Nations people and our, our shared future together. So being here today, I ask for things. Things like your ears to be open and your hearts to be open. While I map out some of our history, some of our progress, 
and some ideas for a path forward together. Because I always say this, nobody's going anywhere in this country. You're not going anywhere, your children aren't going anywhere, your grandchildren aren't going anywhere, and neither are mine. So let's roll up our sleeves and get together and build a better country together because nobody's going anywhere. And that's what I always say. Let's work together. I've said I'm from Little Black Bear in Saskatchewan, the First Nations that's part of Treaty 4. And I would say it's a strong treaty territory. So I grew up out on the res. That's what we call it. Where are you from? I'm from the res. I grew up on Little Black Bear. And I learned about the treaties and the treaty relationship that we have with the crown. And I learned about that from our old people, the elders, the knowledge keepers, the wisdom keepers. And there is a ceremony about that treaty. And every time I talk treaty, what do I pull out? Well, lo and behold, I just happen to have a treaty medallion with me. And what does this treaty medallion represent? It represents first our relationship with the crown. This is Queen Victoria. So we have a relationship with the crown. Nations make treaties. Treaties do not make nations. And so the relationship with the British sovereign is very important. Because Canada was a colony of Great Britain right up until 1982. And so these treaty medallions for us in the number of treaties come to represent something very important for us. Because on the other side, you'll see the newcomer coming on this side, and they're shaking hands with this First Nations person. They're shaking hands. You'll see the hatchet that's buried in the ground, symbolizing no more war, peace between our peoples. You'll see the sun, you'll see the water, you'll see the grass. You'll see big teepees, smaller teepees going into the future. And you always hear this line that as long as that sun shines, the rivers flow and the grass grows, this treaty will remain in effect for those generations now and for those yet unborn. And we say there's a sacredness or a sanctity of agreement with this treaty relationship with the crown. And so those two fundamental principles peaceful coexistence and mutual respect and were to share the land and the resource wealth together. We're to share it. And so even in the number treaties, I don't believe Chief Little Black Bear understood seed, surrender, and relinquish. But that's the words in the treaty. But he knows about we're going to share. Egwa, depth of a plow, we'll share with our white brothers and sisters. So again, back to that principle about peaceful coexistence, mutual respect, and to share the bounty of this land and resource together. That's what this treaty relationship is. It's true that not all First Nations in Canada are treaty First Nations. For example, in British Columbia and in Quebec and in the North, they're not covered by treaty. But in many of these areas, First Nations are working with governments on what can be called modern treaties. But all our people agree with that relationship embraced in the treaties. It's the essence of our understanding of our relationship with Canada, a relationship that's based on the very positive values, peace between our peoples, mutual respect, and we all are to benefit the land and resource wealth, embracing a true partnership. And I believe that it's that relationship, the treaty relationship, that we need to reestablish, reaffirm, and implement. But implement the treaty according to the spirit and intent. The courts continue to affirm the First Nations' understanding of our treaty rights and our inherent rights. But it's also the best way to move forward the best way to achieve certainty and prosperity, the best way to achieve real reconciliation, to close an unacceptable gap in the standard of living for many First Nations people in Canada is to embrace that relationship. That gap that people keep talking about, no question. Six versus 63rd. You know what that is? 2015, big federal government election coming up. 
According to the United Nations Human Development Index, Canada was rated sixth in quality of life. You apply the same indices to First Nations people, we're 63rd. So it was six versus 63rd. That's what I keep trying to address. That gap is holding all of us back, not only for First Nations people, but all of Canada. And it's true that First Nations feel the most severe impacts of that gap from poor housing, contaminated drinking water, tragic epidemic of youth suicides, 1,200 plus missing emerging indigenous women and girls, an overall shortage lifespan other than non-First Nations Canadians, 40,000 children in foster care and provincial care systems and territorial government care systems, too many of our people in jail, disproportionate number of our people in jails. So that gap needs to be addressed. We know that that gap is the result of more than a century of failed laws and policies imposed on our peoples. Laws and policies imposed on us without our involvement or our agreement. One of them, the Indian Act. It's been around since 1876. And I don't want to spend time on the Indian Act, but did you know? <laughs> we weren't allowed to vote till 1961. We weren't allowed to leave the reserve without a permit till 1951. We weren't allowed to have access to legal counsel. And there's a lot of good lawyers here. How many good lawyers in the room? Put your hands up. <laughs> Lots of good lawyers. <laughs> well, if I went and saw you in 1950, I'd get thrown in jail. You'd be disbarred for giving advice to a treaty Indian. Under the Indian Act, it's not good. We still have it. Another example is the genocide of the residential school system. And I don't call it cultural genocide. It's genocide. It fits the United Nations definition, forcibly removing children from their families and homes, inflicting harm and pain, suffering and abuse. It fits. And we still feel the intergenerational traumas of that genocide. So we see it as a flawed system, no question. There's also the flawed funding approach that's led to decades of underfunding, and of course, all the stolen lands and our stolen children. So these policies are dysfunctional and a barrier to progress for all of us, and they must change. And all Canadians feel the impacts of that gap. You feel it through lost productivity, a lower overall GDP growth in Canada, high social costs, high unemployment rates, and underemployment rates. And it's a black mark on our global reputation as a fair and just country. Now that's our past. And together we can look to a different future, because I always say, Let's learn from the past. Let's not live there, but let's do some truth-telling and learn from the past so that we can have a better future together. One where we can take that lost productivity and unlock the full potential of our peoples and the full potential of this country. And that will build a stronger Canada for all of us. First Nations priorities are Canada's priorities. And acting on First Nations priorities is not only good for our people, it's good for all of us, because when we succeed, everybody succeeds. I'm pleased to say that in the last four years, we have made some progress. And I'm always careful when I say this, because, oh, Belgard's a liberal. Or, oh, Belgard's a conservative. Oh, Belgard's a green. Or, and I'm not anything. But I'm a national advocate for change a national advocate for policy and legislative change, and we have to work with whoever gets elected. It's my job. So I get along with all the party leaders, every one of them. So in our terms of our work with this federal government the last four years, over the past four budgeting cycles, every year there's a federal budget, every fiscal year, what's happened? $21.4 billion over seven fiscal years for First Nations issues. When's the last time that happened? The answer is never. 21.4 billion. It's a significant and necessary investment, no question. And it's starting to unlock the potential for First Nations peoples in Canada. And it starts to address those factors I spoke about a moment ago. Lost productivity, high social costs, high unemployment, underemployment, poverty, and the fact that our young people are taking their lives. So the investments 
are way beyond, remember this thing called the Kelowna Accord? And everybody's jumping up and down, Kelowna Accord, Kelowna in 2005. Well, this is four times the Kelowna Accord. Four times the Kelowna Accord. So now that we see that this 21.4 billion is there, it is a direct result of the advocacy by the AFN and the chiefs and other leaders across Canada. We use that closing the gap document to educate people and to show the parties that you've got to close the gap. We had this great document, closing the cap document, closing the gap document, cap, huh? closing the gap document in 2015. And I was unrolling this document platform. And I was saying, we need investments in education and employee, housing and water and infrastructure and youth and all, just stop, don't roll it. And so all these things, I was unrolling in front of this big bunch of reporters because we're using that closing the gap document to influence the party platforms before the October election in 2015. And really great rolling it out. And then a very astute reporter said, well, Chief Belgard, do you vote? And I said, no, I don't vote. And then they asked, well, how do you expect First Nations people to vote if you as national chief don't vote? I said, good question. Let me get back to you on that. <laughs> so I had to go home and get my mandate to vote for my people, my elders, my youth, my aunties, my uncles back on Little Black Bear. Because growing up as a little kid, the elders would always say, no, vote. That's not our government. It's not ours. And we got a treaty with the Crown. We don't have a treaty with the Liberals or the Conservatives or the Greens. Our treaty's with the Crown. So we don't need to vote for anybody. The Crown's got to live by and honor this treaty and according to the spirit and intent. So I was taught that. Then I was also taught that it's not our government. Okay, get it. Don't need to vote. Didn't vote. But 2015 comes along. <laughs> and then when I go home and we go through ceremony, get the green light, okay. Embrace no sum, grandson. This concept of dual citizenship. So I voted for the very first time. I was nervous as hell. <laughs> but I did. And because the National Chief voted, holy smokes, we lit a fire under First Nations people across Canada. Get out the vote. Get out the vote. We have 64% of First Nations people voting now in 2015. That's unprecedented, unheard of. We flipped 22 ridings. So if you want to become government, you better listen to our issue priorities. Are you inking our support? That's where it rests. So we have another election coming up now. So now we're participating. And now we're voting. And we got a left wing and a right wing as Indian people, First Nations people too. So to our Indian sovereigntists here in the crowd, First Nation sovereigntists, I say, I don't feel any less Cree for voting. I don't feel any less a member of Little Black Bear for voting. We've got some political power, we exercise it. That individual human right supersedes the collective right of the people now. So I'm going to keep voting because I've embraced dual citizenship. <laughs> That's what I feel like, and I feel okay about it. So now, back to the federal government investments. And I call them investments. They are investments in First Nations children and families. They're investments in human capital because we're the fastest growing segment of Canada's population, young First Nations men and women. No question. And we're seeing progress. Since November of 2015, the number of long-term drinking waters has gone down, no question. I think it's the latest number is 58 as of March 2019. Still not done yet, but it's moving. There's been significant new investments in post-secondary education and K-12 education for First Nation students. There was a big gap there. On reserve was 6,500 per child for tuition. Yet in provincial school systems, it's double that, 12, 13,000. French school system, almost 20,000. Big gap, K-12. Close that gap. 10,000 students now on the, on the post-secondary student wait list. We still have work to do. K-12, to post-secondary. There's also been investments in housing. So all these things are moving. But I say it this way. Progress doesn't mean parity. Progress doesn't mean parity. The drinking water advisories, 
there's still a gap. We still have a higher risk when it comes to water and drinking water. Some people on the reserves are going to grow up not knowing what it's like to turn on the taps and drink the water. Just the way it is. We still have that 10,000 student number on the waiting lists. No question, that has to be addressed. And in housing, more than one quarter of status Indians live in a house that needs major repairs. And more than one third of our people that live, on, live, in, a, live in an overcrowded house. Think of Cat Lake. Did you guys see that a few months back or a few weeks back? Overcrowded housing, sickness, overcrowded housing, problems with that. So this is not good for anybody's mental, physical health of anyone. So just think of it, how hard it is for a young person to go to school and excel in school while living in an overcrowded house, contaminated with black mold and everything else. So we've got a lot more work to do. There is progress, but our goal must be to maintain momentum and keep moving forward in a positive way. So now October's coming. Closing this gap and moving forward requires we work with, and when necessary, we always got to push our treaty partners, and that's the Crown. And now it's the federal government on behalf of the Crown. We get that. I've already mentioned the investments that are needed. And funding is very important, no question. But we've been underfunded for so long, it's difficult to get out of poverty. So we need those basic resources, no question. We're going to keep pushing for that. But it's not only about funding and financing. We've got to move the right way. We've got to see a more growing self-sufficiency for First Nations, healthy people living in healthy communities with strong governments who can plan strategically and be full participants in the economy. And that, of course, benefits all of us. We need action on our rights, our rights to maintain our identities, and our rights to make the decision that affect our lives. I call it this way, the right to self-determination. Canada will only achieve reconciliation by recognizing and honoring First Nations rights, title, and jurisdiction. So briefly, June's coming. The end of June. That means this current government is going to be done. So I ask me, myself, and all the AFN staff, chiefs, everybody, what are we going to get done by the end of June? What are we focusing on? So there's three pieces of legislation we want to see passed before the end of June, before the House rises. And it's critical to our agenda. First is Bill C-92. And that bill, which is about First Nations taking responsibility for First Nations child welfare. Remember I said there's 40,000 kids in foster care, provincial and territorial care. Bill C-91 is the other one, the Indigenous Languages Act. And then Bill C-262, it's a private member's bill to give life to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Those are the three pieces of legislation. I've got a three-day meeting coming up in July with the Chiefs of Canada in Fredericton, New Brunswick, July 23, 24, 25. I want it to be a happy gathering. So it'll be happy if we get these three bills passed. I want to tell you why these three bills are important and why they, deserve, they, they all deserve your support. Child welfare, C-92. The formal name of that act, it's an act respecting First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children, youth, and families. It is aimed at dealing with the massive and tragic overrepresentation of children in the child welfare system. Every day, our children are taken from their families and placed in government care. And all too often, it's because of poverty. It's not simply about bad parents. But where that's the case, absolutely. We don't want our children in unsafe environments, but we want an approach that as much as possible keeps children with their families, their extended families, in their communities, in their nations and tribes. Decades of underfunding and apprehension is harming our children and families. You might have heard the latest statistic that there are more First Nations children in state care right now than at the height of the residential school system. That's brutally bad. So I say to Canada, we can do better, we must do better. So this legislation is an important piece of the more comprehensive reform that's needed across the system. It's about putting the responsibility for First Nations children back where it rightfully belongs with First Nations. 
And the goal is to apply First Nations laws, policies, and values to systems designed and implemented by First Nations people. I've always said, occupy the field, chiefs. If you don't want federal law or provincial law to apply, create your own laws and exert your jurisdiction and occupy that space. In some places, these systems exist and they're working. In other places, the bill supports First Nations in building their systems to keep the circle of community strong and to protect the young people. Bill C-92 represents a new chapter and a new approach for children and families. And it places a bigger focus on prevention over apprehension. And it says clearly that wherever possible, children must stay at home or in their community with their parents and their relatives so they are close to all of their loved ones. This legislation is about First Nations taking care of First Nations children. And I know many of you are parents. We would all insist on the right to look after and care for our own children. And Bill C-92 is about our authority and responsibility for the welfare and well-being of our children. It's about recognizing First Nations jurisdiction over child welfare. We need to get it done. Now the Indigenous Languages Act, Bill C-91. It's a response to calls over many years by First Nations for action to save and strengthen Indigenous languages. Respecting and storing our languages is a fundamental step in reconciliation. I've said it this way. The Crown has an obligation, a duty, to expend just as many resources to rebuild, rejuvenate, bring back our Indigenous languages as they spend on trying to eradicate and kill them via the residential school system. They've got an obligation to do that. And language is so important to maintaining a culture and cultural identity as peoples. And these languages are the original languages of these lands. They're found nowhere else other than our territories on Turtle Island. I've said they're indeed national treasures. Our traditional knowledge and our worldviews are founded in our languages. They're key to our identity. And we know they're key to our own health and well-being. For First Nations, language is life. And it's why I pushed for an Indigenous Languages Act as a priority. One that should be co-developed with us. And I am pleased that the government responded favorably to that regard. The act has received support from all parties. And we even know from polling that the majority of Canadians, 74% Canadians, support the Indigenous Languages Act. We want it to become law before Parliament rises this summer. So I'm asking for all your help and support. Connect your member of Parliament, even any senator you know, and ask them to support this and get it done. 2019 is the International Year of Indigenous Languages. There is no better way for Canada to mark this year than to pass this bill. It's been co-developed with us to preserve, promote, and revitalize Indigenous languages. I've said it this way, fluency is important. Fluency. I don't need to see Cree on a box of cornflakes. You got English and French there, fine. I need to see and hear how we say all the 60 plus languages, all of them still spoken. How the old people say it, we need to hear and listen the old people, our grandmothers and grandfathers whispering the story, the creation stories into the ears of their little ones. We need fluency. That's what it's about. So as I said before, this is not only good for us, it's good for Canada because studies have shown when young First Nations people are fluent in their language, they know who they are, where they come from. They're more successful in school, and they're therefore more successful in life. So even this Languages Act is an investment in human capital. So you'll see graduation rates go up and employment increase. It's good. Our young people deserve the same opportunity as other, other young people in Canada. They deserve, they deserve that chance to dream and achieve their dreams. The other piece of legislation is Bill C-262. It is a private member's bill on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And we've said it before that the UN Declaration is nothing less than our roadmap to reconciliation. 
and its full implementation is crucial to the proper recognition of First Nations' fundamental human rights, not only here in Canada, not only regionally, nationally, but internationally. Canada is committed to fully implement the UN Declaration. So Bill C-262 is necessary to fulfill that promise. And I know there's some fear-mongering about the UN Declaration, especially the concept about free prior and informed consent. Free prior and informed consent over activities that affect our people's lands, our territories, and our waters, and our rights. People do not need to fear this concept of free prior and informed consent. Some call it a veto. But the word veto doesn't appear anywhere in the UN Declaration. It's actually a way forward, and it's the right way forward. Free prior and informed consent, I say, even goes better than duty to consult and accommodate. And this will not create any uncertainty over resource development projects. It's indeed quite the opposite. Uncertainty is created when governments and industry ignore First Nations rights and title. And that is exactly what leads to uncertainty. And it also leads to conflict, and also leads to blockades, and also leads to court cases if you don't respect rights, title, and jurisdiction. So free prior and informed consent, I say, would ensure that governments and industry and business and First Nations are on board and on side before any development begins, if they sit down and talk. Think about this concept about free prior informed consent in a simple phrase I always use, that be, if you're the federal government, provincial governments, any government or industry, that before you try to build anything, ensure that you've built a respectful relationship with First Nations people. And it's really as simple as that. It's as straightforward as that. Don't build anything, or even try to build anything, until you have that respectful relationship. And that's the best way forward. So we want to see Bill C-262 passed. And again, I'm going to ask you all for your support. Now, October is coming. Big federal election coming. The writ, writ will be dropped sometime. So what's on the party platforms? So what do First Nations want to see? Boy, there's a, there's a range. We know the countdown's underway. And I said there are certain critical priorities that we need to see. There's an opportunity to make history and set an agenda for real change and reconciliation in this country. And we say our agenda extends well beyond a single parliament, our one government. And our agenda has been supported by all parties on certain issues. Our path to growing self-sufficiency to healthy people living in healthy homes and communities is the work of our lifetimes. And a legacy we owe to our people and to those seven generations yet to come after us. It took us all more than a century to create these challenges. And now we need to work together to change our common future. Our Assembly of First Nations will continue to push for an agenda to make progress and continue to walk the path forward for First Nations in Canada together. Yes, there's an election coming in October. And my job as National Chief is to try to influence the national agenda, to influence all party platforms. So we've been working on a new document. I don't want to call it Closing the Gap 2. I don't know if we'll call it Pathway to Prosperity. I don't want to know if we're going to call it Maintaining Momentum, but it's going to be something. And we'll be releasing our priorities soon in that document. But I can tell you today that the overarching goal of our agenda will be redefining the relationship with First Nations in Canada. It really is about moving beyond the Indian Act, which has been in place since 1876, into real recognition of First Nations governments, including our long-standing treaty relationships with the Crown. Let's get our treaty honored and implemented according to spirit and intent. Let's find ways to move beyond the Indian Act, stand up as nations. Our leaders have been pushed, and we've pushed way beyond certain aspects within the Indian Act. Some are already moving beyond it, and others are ready to do so. This Indian Act controls our lives, 
and gives the government of Canada power to make decisions for us. That's not self-determination. Our new agenda will set out our commitments to our traditional duties and responsibilities as stewards of the lands and waters with a view of seven generations from now. So this has to be the number one priority, not only for Canada, but for the world. And we've got to be leaders. We have to know and feel and see that all the policies and plans to transition from our dependency on fossil fuels to clean energy is there and it's got to be clear. We have no choice but to meet the Paris targets and ensure that the Earth does not warm, not more than two degrees. We've got to make sure that it doesn't warm more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. You see what's going on in the world? Big winds, big fires, floods, more icebergs. This is not just a Canada issue. This is a global issue. And so we must maintain and enhance the world's biodiversity. And in some of the most biodiverse, rich regions of the world remain in our territories here in Canada. And we have to draw upon our people's ancient knowledge as together we address the situation we find ourselves in within our natural world. So what I'm talking about, you know, is climate change, greenhouse gas emissions. Our worldview is this. When I gave the greeting, all my relatives, our worldview is this. And we say, we're not really racist as Indians or First Nations people. We don't see color. So when we go to ceremony, we acknowledge this. This is our worldview in like in 30 seconds. We acknowledge the Creator. And then we acknowledge those beings that sit, one in the east, in the south, the west, the north, and they all have roles and functions. We will acknowledge Mother Earth for everything she does for us every day. Father Sky, Grandmother Moon, Grandfather Sun, our relatives, the star people. We will acknowledge our relatives, the four-legged ones. We'll acknowledge the ones that fly, the ones that swim, the ones that crawl. We'll acknowledge the male plants and the female plants. And then we'll acknowledge those four grandmother spirits that look after the waters, rainwater, fresh water, salt water. And then you're so powerful as women, because when life comes, what happens? Water breaks. That's our family. We're all part of that. And we're the two-legged. So I don't care if you're black, white, pink, polka dot. We're the two legged We fit into that worldview. And if we can get that worldview taught and educated in the private sector and in the public sectors, not only in Canada but throughout the world, we might have a chance of keeping that degrees down because we're part of that. And whatever befalls our relatives and any of that thing that I just described will eventually befall us as two legged And that's not acceptable. So we need to move. And we need to use our elders' knowledge, our traditional knowledge, to get this educated and taught, not only domestically, but internationally. I also want to say that our, our new agenda, innovative ways to spark economic prosperity. I would say you can't talk self-determination, self-government, unless you really talk about economic self-sufficiency as well. So unlocking the full potential of our young and blooming population. Canada does have an aging workforce. We have to unlock the potential of our lands and traditional territories in ways that are responsible and sustainable. Even for economic development, there's a lot of economic development people in the room. What are the basic four or five things we say? Greater access to capital is needed. Got to have better access to capital. How to raise money, how to raise funds. More effective procurement policies, locally, regionally, nationally. Procurement's a big issue. Even provincial policy changes and I've said this before to the premiers. I'm going to go to the cough. The cough. <laughs> Just kidding. Council of the Federation. All the premiers are meeting. And so this, this is one simple policy change that could happen. And I've asked them to do this. Before you issue, if you're the provincial government, I've said to them, think of this policy change. As a government, that before you issue a license or permit to any industry operating in your provincial government boundaries, in any sector, whether it be forestry, mining, tourism, whatever, that that company must demonstrate that they've got a strategic plan when it comes to First Nations engagement, when it comes to procurement, 
reps of workforce strategy, benefit sharing, members on their board, all the above. And if that company does not have a strategy or plan, you as a government do not issue them a license or, or permit. Boom. You'll watch a lot of partnerships develop. Policy change. Another piece for economic development prosperity, federal government. Speed up the comprehensive and specific land claims process. It's good for the economy. Really good. It's slow. So if you do all those things, you will set out the agenda to create stronger and safer First Nations communities, stronger econ economic base for all of us. So we're going to keep pushing for better housing, better infrastructure, stronger and safer through restorative justice systems, and new approaches to policing and community safety. We want to make sure that all women, First Nations women, girls, boys, and men, two-spirit and transgender, are free from violence. When I talk about the justice system, Everybody's going to remember two big names, Colton Bushy, John Stiers. So we say this punitive justice system has got to go and look at restorative justice systems. And it's about having our laws recognized and being as equally important as common law and civil law. Canada is a big enough country. It's a progressive enough country to have other laws and systems recognized in addition to common law and civil law. That's about looking at a really comprehensive restorative justice process. And so finally, we need to see continued investments in housing, water and sewer, infrastructure and education, as well as health care. It's a given that we will push for those things. There's no question. So to conclude today, I want to make it clear that our agenda is not simply a federal government agenda. It's a national agenda. Every government, every citizen has a role to play in reconciliation and closing this gap. There is a great deal all of you in this room can do in supporting our agenda, in being agents of understanding and change. Even by you simply being here today tells me you have an interest in our work, in finding our path forward. And I thank you for listening with open hearts and open minds. I'm always open to discussing ways we can work together to shape a future and a country that we all can be proud of. First Nations will continue to push forward for our children and our families. And I know we can move forward faster when we move together. So it's time to keep up the momentum to ensure we see results on the ground in our homes and in our nations, because our agenda is Canada's agenda. So when First Nations succeed, Canada succeeds. I want to say something and acknowledge a very important young man. Marcus Cooney, are you here, Marcus? Marcus, stand up. This young man is 12 years old. He's got a birthday coming up, or he's 11. He's going to be 12 on May 25th, right? He's 12 years old. He's on his reconciliation journey. He's on his education journey. He wanted to be here. It's these young men and women that are going to help create change. So I wanted to acknowledge you and thank you because he's the one that's going to be challenging his mom and dad around the dinner table, his grandparents around that dinner table about what does reconciliation look like? What do treaties look like? How can we work together to build a better country, more respect for First Nations people? And he's here listening. So I want to say a big thank you, Marcus, for doing that. You're awesome. Keep it up. So thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you so much, National Chief Belgard. Um, we uh, appreciate uh, and are conscious of people's time, but the National Chief did uh, kindly agree to take a couple of questions. If there are any, I'm yeah. conscious of your time. Um, and uh, there is a lot of interest. You, you mentioned that at the end, end of, of your speech, that ultimately everybody here is interested in having a dialogue and a discussion. Um, and it's, I didn't mention this before, but it is a sold-out event. 
So that right there, in terms of the Empire Club of Canada, tells me there's got to be a few questions out there. <laughs> okay. There's one. Good afternoon. I believe, just like the Queen, you also have a duty to the unseated, unsurrendered Matisse. And I'd like to invite you to close the gap with us. We'd also like to be re represented and be a part of the native Indians across the country. Thank you. So thanks for that comment. And I just wanted my paper so I can make notes. <laughs> uh, Again, in Canada's Constitution, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit are recognized in Section 35. And even back home in Treaty 4 territory, our, our old people used to say, when John A. Macdonald was the Prime Minister of Canada, he put in place a treaty-making process. And he put the, the Treaty Commissioner in place. And the Treaty Commissioner came out to meet with our chiefs, with Palmaker, Little Black Bear, all of the chiefs. And our chiefs were concerned about their Métis brothers and sisters and their relatives. And in Treaty 4, the chiefs ask Alexander Morris, the Treaty Commissioner, what about our Métis relatives, our brothers and sisters? The chiefs were concerned about our relatives. And Alexander Morris said this, we'll make treaty with you first, as First Nations people, and we'll come back. The Crown will come back. We have to work together to push the Crown to come back for your peoples. And so I can only go by those teachings because you're also recognizing Canada's Constitution. And there's a different relationship in some regards, but I know our relatives back home, and this is a true, what I said is true, the teaching, about trying to push the Crown to come back and deal with your issues. And so however we can work together, we work together. And maybe one day, maybe the Métis will have a one vote for the National Chief too, and then I'll really be concerned about the Métis issues. <laughs> but it's a good point. I think I see a question over here. Just, okay. Don. Thank you, National Chief, for your words today. They were inspiring, a fabulous job as always, and you always speak from the heart, so we really appreciate that. On behalf of the women in Ontario, we want to ask, after 50 years of discrimination under the Indian Act against Indigenous women and their descendants, if the AFN will stand with us to push this government to remove the final discrimination before they break for the summer. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've gone, we, we, we're on the same page. Just so the audience knows, under the Indian Act, there was a really disgrace, uh, discriminatory system against First Nations women. Because under the Indian Act, prior to 1985, uh, an, an Indian woman, I'll just, for simplistic, First Nations woman marrying uh, a non-First Nations man would lose status. But yet, uh, if I married a non-Indian person, she would gain status. If I married, if I married you in 84, She'd be a treaty Indian, you know, <laughs> she'd be a treaty Indian. So there was a discriminatory piece within the Indian Act. And so there's Bill S3, it's the Dacian case, right? And so we're saying we support it all the way back to 1876 of the first Indian Act to end uh, discrimination against First Nations women because of that. And we support that. We will stand with you. We've got chief's resolutions. So there's no question. We've got to end the discrimination, discrimination all the way back to 1876. And so the answer is yes. Great. Ziggy? Hello, Chief Perry. Thank you very much. Um, I want to share a little story with you. My younger daughter uh, decided to go to the University of Ottawa, so we had a family discussion as to her career path. She said she's taking Indigenous Studies. So I was taken back a bit saying, okay. I had to pause for a minute to think about it, but then quickly realized that this is how change starts. It's got to start with somebody, and uh, very proud of my daughter for making that choice. What are some of the opportunities for somebody like my daughter going forward? Good question, and uh, we encourage everyone uh, to go out and listen and learn, get educated, and there's opportunities at the band level, the reserve level, tribal council level, uh, provincial territorial organization level, even at the AFN level. Uh, we are always looking for good people, for research, writers, policy analysts, um, to come help and join the team. So there's opportunities like that. There's summer student programs at each of those levels as well. So she's got to learn how to knock on the door and, and build a relationship. And
and ask people to go for coffee first, go for lunch first, and that's how it get your foot in the door. And uh, it's, I'd encourage that to happen. Okay, we'll do one last question over here. Is there a, a mic on that side? Okay, just one second. What about those raptors? <laughs> it was just too quiet in here. I had to get. Bonjour. Uh, my name is Randall Becker. I am the uh, the traditional council chief of the Temiagamon Anishinaabe in Tomogamy, and uh, I'm also the CEO of Gamut Gold Corporation and uh, the owner of Nimke Mining Services Corp. When we talk about um, moving forward and really sovereignty, I believe I agree with you, is uh, economic development, uh, you know, uh, successful economic development. And the underlying issues I see um, is that the building codes on the reserves are not up to the standard sometimes of everybody else. And also the uh, workplace safety laws on the reserve are different. And that should not be. Because you can go to a reserve and start putting on shingles with running shoes and a ball cap. But if you tried that in downtown Toronto, there'd be uh, tickets for everybody all the way around. And I think that that is an underlying problem with our people too, is that the colleges are training for profit. So the classes are too big, they're not getting the courses they need, they're just getting rubber stamped and thrown out the door, and they, they don't have the knowledge they need to be successful in mining or construction or anything. It's, it's a for-profit thing that this funding is going into. And I would like to also see change on the reserve where we are, our safety standards are on par with Canada, and our building codes are on par with Canada. Um, all through the far north and all through the reserves, if you installed a central sewer and water system the way they're allowed to on the reserves, there wouldn't be clean drinking water anywhere in this country. Hmm. So I would like to ask you if you could lobby for that too as well. Ogima. Thanks, Randall. And um, yeah, we need, that. that's a whole big thing. Uh, building codes on the reserves, safety laws on the reserve, the standards are different. And uh, I grew up on the, on the res, and we didn't have running water. Uh, had to haul water in, in, in wintertime, melted on the wood stove, and I used to really get perplexed as a little five-year-old kid hauling in snow and a big stack of snow, and then after you melt, you only get a little bit of water, and then the, they had to keep doing that. And I went to school off the reserve, grade one, and I didn't know how to flush a toilet because we never had flush toilets. And we just, that's how we grew up. But the issue, of my, my, my long intro, introduction here is that even when we got water, plumbing, and sewer, it wasn't installed properly. It would always freeze up in the winter. <laughs> so we always had to maintain the house, summer and winter, because the standards weren't the same. And so when I say when we have to occupy the field as First Nations people in different laws and different areas and different jurisdictions and different policies, they got to be as good as and are better than provincial law or federal, provincial law or federal laws. So if we occupy the field at Little Black Bear and have our own safety code, it's going to be better than the Canada building code. If we occupy the field in any jurisdiction, it has to be better. And then we have to have the capacity to enforce and implement that code. And that's what we need to keep doing. So we have better services, better infrastructure, comparable to everybody else in Canada. Because right now there isn't one. And it varies because each of those 634 reserves is a separate jurisdiction. Each of those 634 First Nations are at different levels of capacity. Some can do that. Others got a long way to go. So the answer is yes, we can help lobby for that. And the answer is to the chiefs and councils and the people watching or listening, occupy the field, but you got to make sure you also have the capacity to enforce that law. But it's got to be just as good and or better than provincial and federal law. For building codes, all of those things, the safety pieces and law. But we got to keep pushing for that to happen. So that's my comments. Okay? Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, guys.
I'm pleased to welcome Mike Martelli from Ontario Power Generation to the podium to thank National Chief Belgard. Thank you, Kelly. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chief, Chief Belgard, for those inspiring words. Your words gave us pause to reflect, and I know everyone in this room will take your call to action to heart. Personally, I will strive to listen with empathy and do everything I can to support our First Nation partners. It's particularly important to me because OPG has held a special relationship with Indigenous peoples of Ontario for a very long time. Since our inception as a company 20 years ago, Indigenous policy has been a vital part of our identity. The policy has evolved as our business has evolved, but one thing has remained constant. We want to build and grow lasting, impactful, and relate respectful relationships with Indigenous communities near our current and future operations. I am proud of the progress that we've made developing several commercial partnerships for clean energy projects with First Nations communities. The legacy of these partnerships beyond the decades of clean power is a lasting economic benefit and opportunities for skilled workers. Through these projects, our First Nations partners receive long-term revenue stream that helps grow strong communities. Strong communities that can share their culture and continue their traditions. This is something that matters a great deal to OPG and to all of Canada. As Chief Belgard previously said, we focus on bringing back Indigenous languages, ceremonies, cultures, traditions, all that was lost over the past 150 years. This is how we'll generate hope for all Canadian people. With these words in mind, we will strive to do much more. We will strengthen our bonds through openness and trust. We will look to build more mutual beneficial partnerships, and we will continue to listen and serve while respecting the traditional territories and culture of the province's First Nations. Thank you. Miigwech. Thank you. So our event is coming to a close, and we look forward to welcoming you at some of our upcoming events. This night, tonight, we have an evening event focused on Canada's fresh political voices. On June 10th, we are hosting a very special Power and Politics event featuring Vasi Capellos. June 13th, we have a panel discussion on the rise of white nationalism in Canada. And that day as well in the evening, we have an event featuring the Honourable Mary Ng focused on women who build. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for attending. Thank you.